Welcome, Fai. Thank you so much. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you. You probably don't need it, but Peter Singer was born in Melbourne, uh, Australia, in 1946 and educated at the University of Melbourne, University of Oxford. After teaching in England, the United States, and Australia, he has, since 1999, been uh, Ira W. D. Camp Professor of Bioethics in the University Center of Human Values in, at Princeton University. Uh, in 2021, he was awarded the One Million Book Ruin Prize for Philosophy and Culture, which he donated 100% to effective charities. <laughs> Peter first became well known internationally after the publication of Animal Liberation in 1975, which will have a fully updated and revised edition published next year in the name Animal Liberation Now. Peter's book, The Life You Can Say, which you have, I guess, in your gift bag, uh, was first published in 2009, led him to found a nonprofit organization of the same name uh, that has raised more than 75 million US dollars for the most effective charities assisting people in extreme poverty. <laughs> Peter has written, co-authored, edited or co-edited more than 50 books, and his writing has been translated into more than 30 languages. Some of, it, uh, some of his other well-known books are Practical Ethics, The Expanding Circle, Ethics in the Real World, and Why Vegan. In this keynote address, Peter will look back as well as forward, describing some of the highlights and the lowlights of what has changed for animals over the last 30 years, and asking how we can do better in decades to come. So. I present you, Peter Singer. I think you can hear me, right? I don't need the handheld mic. Thank you very much. Thanks for that welcome. Uh, thanks, Fi, for the introduction. And I want to particularly thank everybody who's been involved in organizing this event, a lot of work putting together an event as big as this. Um, it's terrific to be back in person again, meeting with other animal act activists and advocates. So uh, congratulations to all of those who conceived this and have worked so hard to put it together. Yeah. So Animal Liberation was uh, first published in 1975. It has been called the Bible of the modern animal movement. Um, personally, I'm not all that keen on Bibles. Um, <laughs> they, they tend to hang around a long past their use-by date. They get ossified. Nobody wants to criticize them. Um, I'm a philosopher, and I believe that we should feel free to criticize ideas, including ideas that, in general, we're sympathetic with because that's how we make progress and learn from each other. But it was nice that the book was appreciated, helped to spark a movement, and I particularly like the fact that animal activists who had broken into laboratories, for example, and rescued animals, or had taken videotapes uh, revealing shocking details of the kinds of experiments that the experimenters themselves had filmed, left behind a copy of Animal Liberation in order to say why they'd been there. So many of you who I've been talking to today have already said that they read the book and it had an impact on their lives, and I'm delighted to hear that. But just in case there are some of you who haven't read it, a very brief account is that the book argues that our attitudes to animals are essentially based on a prejudice against taking seriously the interests of beings who are not members of our species. We're familiar with prejudices of smaller groups, such as racism and sexism. We know how powerful they've been, how hard they've been to get rid of, and we still haven't got rid of them completely, although we've made a lot of progress in those areas. And I use the term Speciesism, which I didn't invent. I want to give credit to Richard Ryder, who uh, I met when I was a graduate student in Oxford uh, back in the early 1970s. Um, 
I came across a leaflet that he had put out with a picture of a very sad looking chimpanzee who had been infected with syphilis. Um, and he had this word across the top of it, speciesism. Um, and I thought, yes, that is the way to describe what we our attitudes to animals, which are a kind of a parallel with attitudes of racism and sexism. And in saying that, I don't want to make comparisons or anything like that. I just want to say that in all of these cases, you have a powerful in-group and you have an out-group, and the in-group finds it convenient to use or exploit in various ways those in the out-group, and they develop an ideology that elevates themselves and degrades those in the out-group, and they feel that that justifies what they're doing to the point that it almost becomes natural uh, and hard to imagine doing something different. So that's what I'm objecting to about our treatment of animals. And in its place, I suggest the principle of equal consideration for similar interests. So if a being can feel pain, and as far as we know, that pain might be as severe as a similar pain that we might feel, it might be, say, a physical pain like uh, being stabbed or being burnt or something of that sort. Um, if the interests are roughly similar, then it's just as important. It's just as important to prevent that pain happening or to stop that pain happening if it is happening, whether that being is a member of our species or a member of some other species. So that's what I think should be the basic moral principle governing our relations with uh, other animals and, for that matter, the basis of equality among humans as well, the principle of equal consideration, equal weight, if you like, for the similar interests of beings irrespective of their, uh, their race, their gender, or their species. Now, that argument has been, of course, examined by philosophers um, over more than 40 years of discussion, also in public, various talk shows and other occasions that I've been on the media. Um, it's, there's been pushback from researchers using animals and from spokespeople for corporate agribusiness. But my view is, and I think a lot of philosophers actually agree with me, that it stood up pretty well over those years and that there has been no clear refutation uh, of that view that that's the right ethical view we should be taking. Um, and it is discussed in classrooms around the world, in colleges and universities, and in some countries in high schools as well. But although I think the core argument has stood up well, a lot of other things have changed about the way in which we treat animals. And that's why I felt it was really necessary to do a full update of animal liberation today. In 1975, there was no animal rights movement. There were some anti-cruelty societies, the SPCAs, or in England, the Royal Society of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, various humane societies. They focused mainly on cats and dogs, and to some extent, uh, horses, say. Um, they didn't really do much for farmed animals, uh, although if there was sort of a, a blatant, obvious, particular incident of gratuitous cruelty, they might. Uh, they didn't really say much about the use of animals in, in research. Um, so the big change is that now we do have a, a worldwide movement, and we can see that it is worldwide from the people who come here now, and of course, many others as well who couldn't come here. So we have that worldwide movement, and it has made an impact, although the kind of impact that it's made is certainly far from what I would like to see, far from what would actually put into practice the principle of equal consideration of interest. And it also varies around the world as to how much impact it's had, um, and I'll come to that soon. A number of other things have changed. Over those 40 years or more, we've learned a great deal about the consciousness of animals. Uh, we just heard uh, Ruiji Chua talking about uh, what we've learned about fish in the last uh, decade or so. That's a very good example of that. We've also learned a lot about um, more about um, birds and mammals, for example. If you happen to glance at the cover of National Geographic 
uh, this month. It's got an animal on the front cover, a big article about their minds and their uh, emotions that they can feel drawing parallels with us. So there's much more awareness of this now, which is surely helping. We also have, of course, great awareness of climate change, which was not an issue that was on, certainly not on my radar, hardly on anyone's radar, uh, when Animal Liberation was first published. We know that meat and dairy contribute hugely to climate change, that the animal industry in general contributes roughly the same amount as the entire transport sector, all the cars and buses and trucks and ships and trains and aeroplanes. This is a, something that we now can be allied with those who are trying to prevent climate change, as really everybody should be, in trying to cut back the consumption of animal products. And, of course, we also know now more about the health benefits of reducing or eliminating um, animal products from our diet. We've seen that uh, The Lancet, one of the two top medical journals in the world, set up a commission called the Eat Lancet Commission, which is, was basically telling people that both for planetary health and for their own health, they should be dramatically reducing the amount of meat that they're eating, particularly red meat and processed meat, and eating more uh, plants uh, instead. That's another powerful ally that I think we have now. In the political arena, if we look at the United States, we've certainly made some progress, particularly in states that have citizen-initiated referenda, where we've had issues on the ballot about um, particularly factory farm animals. California's Proposition 12 is the best known, but um, there are eight other states, I think, that have passed uh, initiatives at referenda um, and made important changes. And the fact that that happens that way shows that public opinion is on our side when we get the opportunity to put something before the citizens and inform them about it. Unfortunately, fewer than half the states of the United States have uh, the possibility of a citizens-initiated referendum, and that makes it more difficult to make more progress. And when we come to the standard legislative system in the United States, what should be a showpiece of democracy, we find that what is the evident will of the citizens when issues are put before them in a referenda does not get translated into legislation. Instead, money plays a huge role here, and the agribusiness lobby, and to some extent the lobby of those making money out of research on animals, producing uh, animals or equipment for that, um, also have a huge impact in blocking the law. Fortunately, this doesn't happen everywhere. And so we see, for example, in the European Union, there has been significantly more progress made. Um, and in some other parliamentary democracies, I think there's been more as well. But let me just look at the uh, reforms in the European Union, which we've seen. When I wrote Animal Liberation, I focused on three particular forms of confinement of animals because they were the most extreme restriction of animal movement and of its ability, the animal's ability to perform their basic movements, natural instincts. They were individual stalls or crates for veal calves um, and for uh, sows, for the breeding pigs, um, both of which essentially confined the animal in a cage where they couldn't turn around, too narrow for them to turn around. All they could do is maybe take half a step forward or backwards, and they were there all day, in the case of the veal calves, really for their entire life, in the case of the sows for their pregnancies, which was most of their lives, and when they gave birth, they would be in a, another very restrictive kind of crate. So those were two forms, and the third one was the battery cage for hens, which does not allow hens to stretch their wings, um, keeps them essentially crowded with several other hens in a cage that even if there was only one hen in that cage, they couldn't stretch their wings. Now, the European Union, as I said, um, had a lot of voters who were protesting against this and trying to make this into an electoral issue to the point at which they turned to a scientific veterinary committee to investigate whether these practices were compatible with animal welfare. And the committee reported back that they were contrary to good animal welfare and 
All of those ways of keeping animals have been illegal now in the European Union for at least a, a decade after being phased in. I think it's now 27 nations uh, where you can't do that to animals. And by those standards, the United States doesn't look very good. As I say, we have it in some states that have had referenda, but we certainly don't have it everywhere. Other things that have happened have been attempts to give animals legal status by applying for writs of, of habeas corpus, essentially of hand over the body to me, an ancient writ which has only been recognized generally for humans. Um, and that has been tried in various countries uh, here in the United States. And also, actually, interestingly, more often in uh, South America, where there has been uh, at least one case of a, where the writ was accepted, in the case in Argentina. And here in the US, though we haven't had a victory, recently a case relating to an elephant, Happy in the Bronx Zoo, went up to the highest court in the New York State system, uh, a court with seven judges. And although they did, as I have to say, you know, probably expected, they did reject the application, two judges voted against that decision. Two judges voted to accept it. And that's pretty revolutionary in the US system to get that taken seriously. And it's a sign, I think, of possible future progress. In the uh, area where I work, in universities, um, we've seen animals studies being uh, accepted now as an area both of, of research and teaching, and a lot of students taking that. Um, interdisciplinary area that includes philosophy, but also includes uh, all sorts of other kinds of studies, social studies of animals, uh, psychological studies. And that's educating a lot more people in the nature of animals and also in what we're doing with them. And in philosophy, which was actually, I have to say, um, back in 1975, was, there were very few philosophers who took any interest in, in animals. We now find this basically a b issue being taught in uh, practical ethics or applied ethics courses all over the country and in many other countries around the world as well. And it's not only philosophers. If you look at uh, what psychologists are studying, there are now psychologists studying our attitudes to animals, exploring even uh, the concept of speciesism and ways in which humans are speciesist and finding that they are. We're also finding psychologists looking at people's attitudes to meat. Uh, what one group has called the meat paradox. The fact that people, when you ask them, think it's good to be kind to animals, they don't want to harm animals, generally speaking, and yet they eat meat. Um, and there's a kind of a cognitive dissonance going on. And it's shown in the fact that if you bring in groups of students and you say you want to ask them a number of questions, and one group you say, and by the way, after we ask you these questions, we're going to ask you to sample some food and tell us what you think, we're going to give you some hamburger to sample. And a second group, you say, we're going to give you some uh, fruits and veggies to sample. And then you ask them among the questions, what kind of feelings or emotions or cognitive abilities do you think cows have? Guess what? The people who've been told they're going to be sampling hamburger think that cows are less sensitive, less intelligent than the people who've been told that they're going to sample fruits and vegetables, although they're randomly selected groups when they come in. So that's one of the ways in which people tell themselves it's OK to eat meat. They think, you know, cows are dumb animals that don't feel very much. Um, but really, they know that that's not the case, because you know, it's not that they learned something when they were told what they were going to eat. So there's interesting work that helps us to explore and understand people's attitudes to animals. Now, the other big thing that's happened just in the last uh, 10 or 15 years and I'm sure you know about here, is the development of the effective altruism movement. The effective altruism movement, I, again, I presume that most of you know it, but just in case you don't, it's a movement that is encouraging people to be altruistic, to think about how you can live your life so as to make the world a better place, and in doing that, to use whatever resources you've got, which might be time and particular skills that you can volunteer, or it might be money. Um, most of us can give some, and some of us can give a lot. So the effective altruism movement says, use those resources to do the most good that you can with them. In other words, use them as effectively as you possibly can. That's why it's the effective altruism movement. But of course, when you say, make the world a better place, you might want to say, well, what does that mean? 
What are the values that I'm concerned with? And effective altruists may have a range of different values, but a common core is that they think suffering is a bad thing. Pretty obvious, really, when you think about it and you think about your own suffering. Um, and uh, often they think premature death is a bad thing. They don't think that only about humans, or you know, generally speaking, the movement accepts that the suffering of non-human animals is a bad thing, as is the suffering of human beings. And that's been a big positive, because people with the mindset of saying, how can we do the most good, how can we reduce suffering the most for the resources we have, have been active in the animal movement and have helped us to focus on doing just that. Which I think is, is really important and is something we need to be thinking about as we decide how to go forward. Effective altruists have said that there are three things we should particularly focus on when we're thinking about what cause, what particular issue we should take up and put our energy and resources into. That's importance, tractability, and neglectedness. So let me just say something about each of those. What makes an issue important? Well, if it affects a lot of beings in a way that is significant. So again, if we're focusing on suffering, if it can affect or relieve the suffering of many beings, that's better than one that relieves the suffering of only a small number of beings. It's more important to do that. And of course, the more severe the suffering is also, the more important it is to relieve it. Tractability means, can we actually get somewhere with this? Or is the problem so tough, so difficult, that we're really unlikely to make a difference? And that's something that we do need to think about in the animal movement as well. Where can we actually make these gains? I think that's an important part of choosing the cause that we're involved in. And neglectedness. Is this something that a lot of other people are already working on and putting their resources into? If so, probably it's less likely that I can make an impact because there's so much work already going on in this area. Or is it something that's relatively neglected, especially relative to the size, going back to the importance of the problem? If it's relatively neglected, given the importance of the problem, then maybe I can make a difference, make a, a bigger difference than I would if I went into some area that a lot of people were already working on. Historically, the animal movement has generally not done this, unfortunately. To be blunt, the animal movement still, today even, puts most of its resources into an area of relatively smaller importance. If you look at where the money goes, it's still the case that the ma majority of donations to the movement go to organizations trying to assist dogs and cats. Now that's starting to change a little with more money going into farmed animals, but it's still the case. You can understand why. People have dogs and cats in their homes. They love them, they care for them, they see them as individuals. When they see an animal being hurt, a stray, stray dog or an animal dog being abused, their heart goes out to it, and they donate to organizations that collect for that. But if you put the number of abused dogs and cats against the number of farmed animals who are suffering, and I've already talked about some of the ways in which uh, they're suffering, you hardly see it. If you put it on a, a bar chart or something like that, it's, it's tiny compared to the number of farmed animals. And yet, you know, then I have a contrasting chart of where the money's going, and you still have a lot of money going into that tiny area. And even when we come to focusing on, um, say, a specific group of animals, the animals used in research, not farmed animals, we still find more concern about dogs and cats than about rats and mice, although rats and mice constitute the vast majority of vertebrate animals anyway. Um, well, I guess there's a lot more fish going on as well now, but um, still the majority of, of uh, animals being used in research. Again, that's something that I think we, we need to try to change. We need to pay more attention to the less attractive animals. That includes the farmed animals, as uh, was just mentioned uh, before by Ruiji Chow. When we're talking about land animals uh, and farmed animals, that's overwhelmingly chickens. But when we talk about vertebrate animals in general, 
we are talking really about, about fish. And even if we're talking about farmed animals, actually, um, there are more farmed fish, which is really a form of factory farming, than there are farmed chickens uh, as a whole. And we find that because, perhaps because fish don't attract us in the way that uh, mammals do, um, and even chickens, we, we relate to fish less, I think. So the cruelty that is inflicted on fish is really quite remarkable. Um, and let me give you one example, which I owe to Fai here, who introduced me to this. I must say I didn't know about it until relatively recently. The species of fish that is most raised in aquaculture is something that probably many of you have never heard of. It's a loach, L-O-A-C-H. Um, something like 18 billion loaches are farmed each year, vast majority of them in China. Now, loaches are small fish, maybe about that long, and they have a certain kind of skin, which is rather like that of an eel. And that's relevant because uh, one of the things that is done to loaches is that they are made into a soup. You can go online and you can find a video about how to make the Korean version of loach soup, which is apparently a traditional Korean soup. And this is not a video made by animal activists. This is a video made by Korean foodies, people who like this soup and want to know how it's made. And you see in this video, buckets of loaches brought in. Loaches can live for a while without water, brought in. And then as they're lying in this uh, big basin, salt is sprinkled all over them. And you see immediately that they are in pain. They're writhing vigorously from the salt. And essentially, they're being killed by osmosis. The salt solution sucks the fluids out of their body, and they die from that. Um, it's clearly a very painful death. And yet, as I say, you know, here it is. It's being used on a, on a very large scale. And the people doing it are so unaware or thoughtless of, of the suffering that they don't mind showing that to everyone in the world. I think in one of the videos I saw, there's a, a Korean person doing this, comments, um, yes, there's some pain, but um, if you want to make a good loach soup, you have to do this. Um, well, how important is it to do that? So that's just one example. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to particularly pick on people from a Korean background. I have a lot of people in Korea who are very concerned about animals. But um, you know, it's one example of the neglect of fish suffering that is going on. And this is, therefore, an area that is both important, because there's so many beings, and we can be pretty confident that they're sentient beings. I hope that it's tractable. I hope that we can change these practices. Um, and they are certainly, at this stage, still very neglected. Now, there are other issues that are neglected, too. You might say, well, what about insects? Is that a neglected issue? And again, we've got the development of insect farming on, uh, again, a, a vast scale. Um, here we're talking about trillions of insects being produced. Originally, when I first heard of insect farming, the, the story was that this is a really high protein source that can help to feed people with less damage to the climate than producing uh, beef, for example. But in fact, most of the, uh, what insect farming is doing is producing animal feeds food for factory farmed animals or, or factory farmed fish. So it's not actually producing protein to feed the world. The question here, of course, is are these insects sentient beings? And I think the evidence is less clear here. And of course, insects, is a, there are about a million different species of insects, something like that. So it's, you, know, you couldn't just give a yes, no answer for all of them, I don't think. Um, so we don't really know. And maybe that's one reason for hesitating. But if the numbers are so large and there's a chance that they're suffering, we could try. But here, tractability comes in. Are people ready yet? Is the public ready for concern about insect well-being? Possibly not. I used to think that we weren't ready for fish. I, I think, do think we are ready for fish now. Um, I'm not sure about insects. There's always some point where you think, yeah, it would be good to work on that, but is it really going to work? And that here, too, I would like to mention uh, the suffering of wild animals, because that's another area where I've been doubtful in the past that we really are ready to focus on wild animal suffering. I've been worried about possible conflicts with environmental concerns. I think we want to work together with environmentalists as far as we possibly can. Um, but I think now 
we are certainly ready for doing research into wild animal suffering and seeing if there are things that we can assist with. Um, after all, if whales get stranded on the beach, we try to rescue them. You could say that's interfering with nature. There could be other cases like that. Fish are wild animals, are those not in fish farms? Uh, and yet we're doing terrible things to them. We can campaign against that and with support, of course, of you know, people trying to preserve the marine ecology. Uh, and we can work with wild animals living in the suburbs, which are not natural ecosystems anyway, and try to reduce kinds of suffering that are inflicted on them. So again, that can be a, a large number of animals. Not quite sure that we're ready to go to make that a priority, but I do think it's good to have to know more about it, to try and find out more about the lives of wild animals. The other thing that I, I want to emphasize, we need, as I've been saying, to take a global perspective. And in taking a global perspective, the big area of great importance, because such a large number of animals are involved, and where the suffering is severe, but where tractability maybe is doubtful, is China. China has now become the largest producer of pigs and an enormous producer of factory farm chickens. There are no national animal welfare laws in China. Um, essentially, what is being done to animals is whatever will produce them uh, as cheaply as possible. How, how can we make an impact on this? Well, one way may be to promote the development of plant-based meat-like foods, or possibly cultured meat, meat grown at the cellular level without animals. Um, that's important for, could be important for climate change, could be important, of course, all over the world, but it does seem to be an avenue where China is interested in that, is producing that themselves to some extent, and if it can be done in a way that is economically competitive with the meat products, maybe may make a difference. But I'd also say any of you who have a background in China or have contacts in China to try and explore whatever opportunities there may be for reducing the suffering of animals, the extent, continued growth of factory farming there. Because without that, even though we can make progress in Europe and make progress in the United States and maybe make progress in Central and South America and a number of other countries, we are not going to be ending the suffering of animals in the way that we would all like to unless we can bring that about in China as well. To conclude, I think we have made significant progress over the past 40-something years. I think we have much greater awareness of animal issues. We have a strong movement in many countries. We have the development of plant-based eating and vegan products widely available. We have many of the things that were mentioned beforehand in terms of the changes that have been made, like uh, moves to ban fur, but uh, we still have animals continuing to be mistreated, especially for food. That's a continuing atrocity on a scale so vast that we can't comprehend it really. We've made a start in the movement to end that, but ending speciesism is a huge transformation of the way we live, at least as big as the transformations needed to end racism and sexism and we have to stick to the task until we succeed. I see this meeting as continuing that task and I hope there'll be further meetings in which you and others come together and resolve to continue that fight until we end speciesism. Thank you very much. I'll keep the fun question. I, I know you, you're uploading that question about fun. Uh, I'll keep that for later. Uh, and I, I'll ask the serious question about long-termism uh, in the second one, but uh, let's keep it simple. How do you implement veganism and practice animal liberation in your daily life, Peter? And how has that evolved over the years since writing Animal Liberation? Okay, when I wrote Animal Liberation, um, I was a vegetarian, um, I wasn't a vegan. There were very few vegans around in uh, that time. There was, I was living in, in England, as I said, I'd been doing my graduate work in, at the University of Oxford, and then I had a very junior two-year teaching appointment. That's when I started writing Animal Liberation. 
Um, I finished it when I had a visiting assistant professor job at New York University. In the UK, there was a vegan society. I think it had 300 members. That was probably most of the vegans in the UK at that time. Um, most people wouldn't have known what the word meant. Um, you know, maybe you're some kind of alien from the Star Vega or something. I was not a vegan and I only gradually came to see uh, the importance, particularly of the suffering in the dairy industry and of course a lot of suffering in the egg industry generally, although there may be some people who have keep their laying hens in better conditions. Rather gradual that I cut that out. Um, and I have to say, I'm not strictly a purist about this. So one of the things that I discussed in Animal Liberation is, do we think that all of the beings who are zoologically classified as animals can suffer? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical, for example, that an oyster can suffer. Um, has a very simple nervous system. It can't really avoid pain. It can't move away from pain. So it makes it questionable whether it would have evolved a sense of pain. So, you know, I don't really object if people want to eat oysters. It's not that I do eat oysters um, much, but, um, you know, I think that it's, 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 it's not really what I'm involved in. And, of course, if there were um, cellular meat, that would be meat. And I guess strictly you couldn't say you're a vegan if you're eating meat. But I don't see a problem with that. In fact, I encourage the development of cellular meat because I think that would you know, solve the animal suffering problem and uh, solve the climate greenhouse gas problems of, of meat. Uh, also the health problem of um, antibiotic resistance. You wouldn't give antibiotics to your cellular meat um, and they wouldn't develop viruses that could get out and cause new pandemics. So, you know, to me, being, being vegan is not a sort of a goal in itself. Um, it's a path and a simple term for saying I'm avoiding inflicting suffering on uh, animals through my diet um, and I think that's an important thing to do. But you know I think you know one of the issues here is we want to get more people to dramatically reduce the animal products that they eat and if they feel they can't do that hundred um, percent I don't think we should be too critical of them. I think we should welcome them as joining the movement. Maybe they'll get to hundred percent, maybe they won't. But really what's important is to try to essentially reduce this enormous industry that is treating animals so badly and so bad for the planet. And we need to think tactically about the best way to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the second voted question now is back in 75, I believe, when you wrote the book, did you imagine seeing the animal rights movement as it is today? When do you believe we will see the animals finally free? Okay, um, so I wasn't sure what would happen really with the publication of Animal Liberation. Of course, I was delighted that um, it was being published. On the one hand, I thought to myself, gee, you know, this argument really is convincing, you know? I'm certainly convinced, and as I said, it, I think it stood up fairly well, so I guess I, was, I wasn't being just deluded about that. So really, you know, people should read this book and they should say, wow, this is terrible, I'm gonna stop eating meat, and there'll be, you know, a mass uh, vegetarian movement anyway, um, and uh, the meat industry will start to go into sharp decline. That was my optimistic mood. And then my pessimistic mood was, gosh, you know, there's this enormous industry out there. It's going to do what it can to essentially pour, you know, pour ridicule on this book so people don't take it seriously. And then also there's just people who are so much in the habit of eating meat, you know, even when, uh, my wife and I became vegetarian. Uh, you know, a lot of our friends said, oh, you know, you become some, some kind of cult you've got into or something like that. My more pessimistic moment, I thought that the book will probably just be ignored. Um, and obviously what happened was somewhere in the middle of those two. Um, we do have an animal movement. I'm glad that there's a movement, but I'm sorry that the movement, in a sense, still has to exist all of these years after the book was published because in my optimistic self would have said, wouldn't it be necessary anymore. Uh, 40 to 50 years later, but it is so you know as it is necessary I'm I'm delighted that there is such a strong movement that it's expanded to many other countries um, And I hope it will keep going from strength to strength and we'll get more and more victories which will encourage more people to join it Long-termism seems to be gaining major popularity in the effective altruism movement do you think it will help or hinder uh, the cause of animal welfare within the EA? Yeah, so firstly, let me say, um, I welcome the fact that there are people who think about reducing the risks of our species becoming extinct. 
Um, I agree. I, most people will agree that it would be a bad thing if our species became extinct. I know some people think animals would be better off. But in, in the long term, in terms of producing a better world, and particularly those who are concerned about wild animal suffering, might think that even for animals in the long term, that would not be a better thing. So I'm glad that there are people thinking and talking about reducing that risk and taking that long-term view. I think that's important. But I don't think this should dominate the effective altruism movement. It should be one area of concern that some people will be attracted to, people who take that very long-term view, alongside other areas of concern, some of which are about humans, as uh, Fai said in introducing me. I've uh, uh, founded this charity, The Life You Can Save, which tries to get people to recognize that some charities helping people in extreme poverty are much more effective in what they're doing than others. And we curate a list you can find on the website of The Life You Can Save that um, will help people who want to give to global poverty. And I um, gave some of my Berger and prize winnings to, to that as well. But I also think that it's really important that animal suffering should remain as one of the major areas of the effective altruism movement. And so I want that to stay, and I don't want people to get the impression that effective altruism is all about long-termism. I think that would be a bad thing for the movement as a whole, um, as well as being a bad thing for animals and for people in extreme poverty and other possible effective causes that will come up in future. Uh, over 99% of animals live in the wild, but solving problems in wild systems is complicated. Do you think animal advocates should put more effort into researching ways to reduce disease, starvation, or the other naturally occurring sources of animal suffering? Yeah, I'm not sure about that figure, really. I guess it, if you include insects, you get that 99% figure. Is that right? I'm not sure where that comes from, because you know, certainly there are far more chickens in the world than any other species of bird. But I do think, yes, I mean, there's ve wild animal suffering is a, is a neglected cause. There's no doubt about that. There are very few people working on that at this stage. And I think it would be good if a lot more people were working on that, um, doing research into it, into trying to estimate the ways in which wild animals suffer, whether their lives, as some have claimed, are on balance negative or not, um, and what kind of interventions can we make that uh, will reduce wild animal suffering without, at least without in the near future, um, getting us at loggerheads with those who want to preserve natural ecological systems and uh, as far as they possibly can. Do you think it matters uh, for the suffering to be human caused or not? Do the suffering count differently in these two okay. cases? No, so I think um, suffering is suffering, whether it is inflicted by humans or is a part of a natural events, like a, a drought, for example. I think this, the badness of the suffering isn't affected by how it's caused. Now, how it's caused might, of course, relate to the way in which we try to respond to it, because if it's caused by humans, we can try and change that, may try to make certain practices illegal if we can, or persuade people not to engage in them. If it's a natural process, um, we can't do that. But um, we should not think that sort of nature is some kind of benign agent that is looking after the world and we should not interfere with. You know, people often use, often say, well, that's natural, as if to say that's good. Um, and it's used in advertising a lot. But I think that's a mistake. You know, nature is an evolved system. It didn't have a purpose. It didn't have any kind of goal. Um, some of the things that it produces are, are good. I think it's good that it's produced sentient beings um, uh, and intelligent beings, but uh, we shouldn't assume that when it causes enormous amounts of suffering, uh, when that's natural, we shouldn't assume that that's therefore a reason for not trying to reduce it. Okay. Some applause for that. I, no I noticed the hesitation. That's okay. <laughs> You've advocated for something in the past called the Paris Exception, which I personally haven't heard of, so keen to learn about it. What is it about, and do you still hold this philosophical view? Okay, so the, the Paris Exception it was not my term, I want to say. It, it does relate to what I said about thinking that being vegan is not a matter of sort of absolutes, that you have to be 100% pure. And I can't remember now who came up with that term. 
but it was someone who really enjoyed gourmet food, right? Really very fine restaurants. Um, but he essentially agreed with the arguments as to why we shouldn't be consuming animal products. But he said, you know, suppose he finds himself in Paris once, for, let's say the first time in his life, he hasn't traveled much, um, and he's in Paris, and he has the opportunity to go to a Michelin three-star restaurant, um, but it doesn't have a vegan dish on the menu, and no, this was, certainly was would have been true in Paris some years ago, they're getting a little bit better. Um, if you ask for one, they'll just roll their eyes at you and say, you know, no, you're in France, you know, uh, the, our cuisine, our cooking is one of the great national treasures, you know, if you want to eat it, you have to eat it the way we traditionally do it, and that is certainly going to include butter and cream, if, even if it's not going to include uh, meat or fish. So the Paris exception was to say, okay, look, I'm going to be a vegan um, unless I find myself in these kinds of circumstances, and then I'm going to make an exception. I'm going to say, this is something I wanted to do for years when I have one of these meals, um, and I'm going to do it. And, and essentially, you know, it's not really doing a lot of harm, is it? You know, one more piece of fish or meat or cream or butter or whatever it is that is eaten. If this person wants to do it, of course, it might be that after being a vegan for many years, you don't want to do that anymore. You think about where it's come from, and you think, no, I don't want to do it. And I think I'm, you know, by and large, in that, in that camp. So, you know, I'm not going to blame people who, who, who do that. Uh, I'm not going to be hard on them. There are cases where I think you can feel OK about doing that. No applause this time. <laughs> thank you, thank you. There is. OK. Maybe you're just getting tired of applauding, which wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, right? How have you personally, over the years, coped with the psychological impact that the exposure to animal suffering can have? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And um, doing this revised edition of Animal Liberation actually was really quite depressing in various ways. Um, and it reminded me, in fact, of when I've been writing Animal Liberation itself, because I spent a lot of time then going over documents of what was done to animals in laboratories and looking at farming journals. There was nothing online, of course, then. I spent a lot of time in the New York Public Library looking at farming journals describing you know, how to keep your laying hens or uh, veal calves or whatever they were so that they were the most productive and you got the highest price for their uh, calf meat by keeping the calves anemic and how many hens you could cram into the cage. Uh, that was really depressing. And in some sense, it was, I guess it was driving me on to think, you know, I need to make this better known. But it was also really depressing. And I would come home from those days spent reading this stuff and uh, I was pretty down. You know, over the years, I've, every now and again, I come across things like that that are depressing. Watching that uh, video that Fi sent me the link to, thank you, of the loaches. Pretty depressing too. Um, and then doing, uh, doing the research, actually, you know, I had believed from what various people had said that animal experimentation in the United States was enormously improved from what it was when I wrote uh, Animal Liberation. Various people had said that to me. Stephen Pinker, who's a, a, a colleague who I know, writes in his book, Better Angels of Our Nature, that one of the worst things he ever did, he did as a psycho psychology graduate student, when he tortured a rat to death. Um, he didn't intentionally torture the rat to death, but in effect, he acknowledges that that's what he did on the instructions of his professor to run a certain kind of experiment, and the rat died overnight. And he came back and found it dead. But he then goes on to say, but this could never happen today. The difference between then and now is like the difference between night and day. We have these institutional animal use and care committees in the United States, and things are vastly better. Well, that's not true, I found, unfortunately. Um, I'm, you know, maybe students wouldn't do the, this kind of exact experiment that Stephen Pinker did, but there's a lot of very bad and pretty pointless, unnecessary experimentation being done in the United States and in a lot of other countries as well. You know, Europe may be a little better controlled, but it's certainly not vastly different. Um, and again, China is a big problem because actually some European researchers are now moving their labs uh, to China. Major German primate researcher moved his lab to Shanghai. This was pretty depressing too, I have to say. Is sentience a sliding scale or a binary? Is there any other way to think about sentience? You know, one answer would be both. Um, 
but it's, I think it's binary, right? I think either the being is capable, is, is a conscious being, is capable of feeling something, or it's not capable of feeling anything. In that sense, it's binary. But it might well be that in some organisms, what a being feels is, is a sort of a dull consciousness that it doesn't feel the kind of acute sensations that we feel or that other vertebrates may feel. So in that sense, I suppose there must be a continuum. Obviously, uh, our minds evolved. We still see other animals. You know, I just talked about oysters a moment ago, and I was talking with somebody about, uh, in Animal Liberation, actually, in the first book, I talked about bivalves. Um, bivalves include oysters, mussels, clams, and scallops. He said, you know that scallops actually have some kind of rudimentary sight, uh, vision, they have kind of eyes, um, and of course they're more mobile than oysters, they actually can move by getting seawater sort of pumping through. So, you know, it's quite possible that scallops are sentient and oysters are not, and, but the sentience of scallops might not be the sentience of that other mollusk that we've all been hearing about, the octopus. Minds evolve in different ways, um, as the octopus mind is involved and as vertebrate minds have evolved. So I think it's on, sentience is on or off, but that doesn't mean that there aren't, may not be um, different degrees of capacities to feel pain or to have negative or positive emotions and feelings, something of that sort. Okay. Would you say veganism is a utilitarian or deontological position? Ah, okay. So for those who are not philosophers, utilitarianism is the view that the right action is the one that produces the greatest net positive balance of pleasure over pain that you can produce. And deontology simply, essentially means the ethical view that whether something is right or wrong depends on whether it falls under some rule or principle. So not based on it, what its consequences of the action are, but whether, for example, there's a rule against it. That's a way of explaining what I said about being vegan. Because if you're being vegan and you think that it's always wrong to eat an animal product no matter what, so let's say you're on an aeroplane, they haven't produced your vegan meal, instead they've served and put in front of you this meal that is not vegan, you look at it, but, you know, yeah, okay, you're hungry, you're prepared to eat it, and you know that it's just going to be thrown out if you don't eat it. In that sense, you know, there's nothing wrong with eating it, as far as I can see. You know, well, are you going to set a bad example? Let's say nobody is sitting next to you and watching what you're eating. You know, you can, you can, you can make the, the case such that there's no bad consequences whatsoever from eating um, a non-vegan meal. Now, a deontologist will say, yes, but you should accept the principle that... Um, you should never eat um, an animal product or something of that sort, then the deontologist will say what you're doing is wrong. Because I'm uh, a utilitarian, I'm concerned about consequences, I'm not going to say in those circumstances that it's wrong. So for me, veganism is a, uh, a, a strategy for reducing suffering of animals and uh, reducing climate change and all of those other things I mentioned. It's not a rule in itself that you must never break. For deontologists, it is. So now you can perhaps decide when you think about your attitude to veganism, are you a utilitarian or some other kind of consequentialist, or are you a deontologist? Up to you. Uh, very short, one sentence, maybe two. Give one piece of advice to the whole world. <laughs> well, think about all the consequences of your actions and try to do those that will have the best consequences. Great. I'm inspired. And the fun questions, I'll ask them together. The ambience tonight is like a rock concert, and the headline act is Peter Singer. So Peter, would you be willing to body surf the crowd? And, and uh, I like this. Your last name, Peter, a singer, will you be at the karaoke <laughs> in Auburn later? Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to body surf the crowd because I think I might break something. <laughs> um, and, you know, somewhere, I guess, in my family background, there must have been somebody who could sing. But those genes got lost. <laughs> so they're not there now, and no, I won't be at karaoke 
That's to your benefit. Sorry. <laughs> hey, Peter. Thank I'm you. going to the karaoke. What if I tell you maybe it's wrong? Like that is an effective thing to do for you to be there for maybe ten, five or ten minutes. <laughs> I'm making this up. <laughs> I'm not going to sing. I'm sorry. You're really better off without hearing me sing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, for being here. I enjoyed yeah. it. I hope you enjoyed it too. Thanks, Rob. Been a great audience. Thank you very much. Thanks again for putting this together. Thank you.